I mean, it may not be alien, but it's, I mean, it's foreign or it's, it's you know, Skunk Works testing something, but it is well outside of, yeah. of what, you know, I mean, of what we know. The fact that they're, they're not based on, like, uh, combustion, they're not combustion-based right. yeah. maneuvers. Yeah. They um, are anti-gravity or, or manipulating gravity, but oh, here we go. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Anyway, we'll pick that up later. <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, welcome to the Video Reformation Podcast. I'm Ben Oliver. Justin Plant. We're the co-founders of Storyboard Media and your guides to practicing effective video for business. We're like the Father Marin to your father, Damien Karras, from The Exorcist. Yeah. I, I just watched a scary movie the first time in a long time. It was, uh, uh, it was actually an A24 film. <laughs> um, the Conjuring. No. Shoot, I should have had Hereditary. I have not seen that. So fucked up. That was the one where they were like testing people's heart rates during the screenings. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. And yeah, some pretty scary stuff. Is that on Netflix? Uh, I think it was a Netflix Prime. release, it's wasn't Prime. it? It's on Prime. Okay, then I guess it wasn't a Netflix release. I'll have to check it out. But Midsummer, the uh, same director. Uh, Midsummer uh, okay. that just came out. That's really good too. Yeah, uh, he's done some weird stuff. Uh, so today our topic is. How to be a good client. Uh, before we jump in, uh, usual housekeeping. In fact, this episode is probably a perfect example for our little housekeeping message here. This was one of our most requested topics. Um, I don't think it was requested by any clients, necessarily, mm-hmm. but it was requested by a lot of the video makers uh, that do listen to the podcast uh, over several months, and for some reason we just keep forgetting it, but... We have gotten a ton of insight into uh, what it takes to be a good client that we're going to share with you. So keep the topic suggestions coming. Uh, Anything that you want us to share with our audience, let us know. Um, We also have a new sponsor for this episode. I was hoping burrito water would still be here. I know. We're in talks. Okay. So, yeah. Um, How they can get out of their contract. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Um, our sponsor this week is Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers. So stick around for later in the episode, and uh, we'll hear their spot. But welcome to our new sponsor, Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers. Say that five times fast. Uncle Rusty's Trunk... Trunky Busters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's better. <laughs> Hold on. We have a new sponsor. No. <laughs> Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers. All right. Um, so... On to our topic. I don't know how well organized this is, um, but we have a ton of examples of how to be a good client. Here. It's about as organized as uh, a bunch of wives having wine complaining about their husbands. It's just a bunch of like throwing complaints <laughs> out there. And then, and then I'm going to ask you, how do we turn that into a suggestion <laughs> for, our, for, for clients? It's kind of it's, what's here. <laughs> but but a bunch of wives having wine talking about their husbands is also very much like how a lot of clients share internal feedback. <laughs> Roll right into it. <laughs> That's where I thought you were going with it at uh, first, and uh, you went a different direction. Um, no, we're going to do our best not to make this like a big uh, complaining no, rant no, no, no. or anything like that. No, and, and uh, I, I think there are probably ways that we should discuss how producers can help their clients be better clients too. Cause it's not just all on the client. And some of these I think are, are yes, through experience and anecdotally we've realized, Oh, this is what we would like. But also some of these are, Oh man, when a client did this, that, that made everything so much better. And I didn't, it wasn't something I would have suggested to them or, but it's right. something they brought to set or they brought to the project that was like, wow, that's really great to have that in a client. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be interesting actually to start with the submissions we got. We've got a big sure. list of, of our thoughts, but I, I think it might be a little bit more insightful just to hear from some of the feedback and then just These kind are of other use it as a, or producers, yeah, uh, that kind of agency thing. employees, you know, project managers, you know, uh, former employees of ours, you know, freelancers we work with. Uh, it's a whole you know wide group here. Um, so first one on on. I'm going to go ahead and drop his name. He'll love it. He'll love it. Um, So this one is from Hamed, Hamed Muhammad, who uh, was our first full-time employee, has gone on to some great agencies since. 
Um, and his first one is be honest about the approval process up front. Um, he's got more here, but but instead of just reading a paragraph, uh, to paraphrase, he's basically talking about like, as the client, if you're responsible for uh, finding a vendor, uh, managing a project, being a point person on a project, mm -hmm. and yet you don't have final decision power, mm -hmm. you need to let to the agency know who has the decision power. What's the actual process here? Um, a lot of point people like to, uh, you know, try try to to take on as much as they can for their job, right? Impress their boss, do a good mm -hmm. job, but, but and also impress the agency. Exactly. At the same time, impress the agency, saying I got this, and then you get all the way to like a final approval, and he's like, all right, well, let me send it to my boss, and all of a sudden, there's someone with new three ideas. new rounds of revision. Yeah, and and I think that goes also to. To making sure that the that all of the decision makers are involved from the beginning, because there's so many individual perspectives. How realistic out is there. that? Do you think? I, I mean, the size of the company. I, I, again, I mean, the first opportunity for an agency to to help their clients be better clients is to force the question: mm -hmm. Who is all involved mm -hmm. in this, and how much do they want to be involved? Mm -hmm. Do they want? Um, do they want to be part of every small decision, or do they want to be ultimately informed? of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Do they want to be just kind of apprised of the situation once a week? Do they need to be involved in every decision that's made? Or do we know that they're going to have final sign off? Mm -hmm. and, and they're not coming in until the third round. Exactly. And so even if you can't bring somebody in from the beginning, knowing that that person's going to be there as a client sharing that that person's mm -hmm. going to be there can help anticipate problems. What might some of the problems be? be when you do get somebody coming into the middle of the process. I think contradictory feedback. Like, mm -hmm. all, all, like let's say we put a certain color grading on it, right? And it kind of gives it a somber tone or something. And they come in and, and blow it all up and say, it's not happy enough. <laughs> like, well, we just went through three rounds of revisions trying to make it somber. And you don't really understand. You don't know that as the final decision maker. You weren't a part of that process. So maybe we could take some time to explain and talk through some of it. Um, this kind of, I think a lot of these are going to overlap. <laughs> yeah. that we've already yeah. brought up several different things. We're just but. using the one prompt and that's going to fill up the entire hour. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, and go on. No, I was going to ask what, what else? I, I, I mean, I think, I think that's the, it's the contradictory, but it, it's that, and maybe this is the way to tie in, you know, the, the best vendor client relationships are those that, that are, partnerships, mm -hmm. right? There's a trust there. There's a collaboration there. Mm -hmm. It's not that, that somebody's just doing the work for somebody else, but they're actually working together to get something done. Mm -hmm. So ideally the client has a vision for something, whether that's, I know that it needs to accomplish X or I want it to feel like Y, or I want to make sure that somebody does Z, right? Like their vision doesn't have to be a creative, like visual, what this video should look like. Yeah. Right. It's just this is what I, I, I need this piece. thing to do. This is its purpose. This yeah. is its intention. This is its vibe, whatever. And so there's a lot of back and forth. I mean, I mean, so often we talk about, well, for the first four or five years of, of us as a company, we defined revisions as those things that happen between the first cut and, and the final cut. The final cut. Mm -hmm. And the way that we operate now is that we have one round of revisions, but at multiple stages throughout the entire process. Yep. So there's there's a round of revisions at the creative treatment. Yep. Right? There's a round of revisions at the script. Yep. There's a round locations. of revisions at, at casting locations. Uh, you know, yeah. And then first cuts. And, and right, some so. clients like to be, get their hands dirty as that much and some just like let me know when you got a first cut. Sure. <laughs> and that's but that's part of that communication and, and up front discussing what those expectations are from a re re revision standpoint. Yeah. And if there's one person who's primarily responsible for having those conversations with the video agency, um that's a I mean you're 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 molding something. You're creating something together. You're making all of these little decisions along the way. And to then bring in someone at the end of that process who hasn't been a part of the reasons about why we're doing this mm -hmm. instead of this. You know, you said color. One of the ones that comes to me is like, how, how salesy is this message? Is it feature oriented or mm -hmm. is it benefit 
oriented. Mm-hmm. How, what level, especially for us, what level of humor do we want to go with? Mm-hmm. This is this something where we want to be like, no punches pulled, you know, go for the jugular, be well, attention getting, or do we want to be like subtle and witty? That's one of the hard things humor. about like a, a, a live action scripted piece is that once you shot everything, that's all you get. Like if you take out, if you didn't design this in such a way where that humor can be removed right. or added, like there's no scale that you can, you know, the slider that you can move up yeah. and down, you kind of got what you got. And if it didn't work, or if we get to third round and the CEO wants to step in and say, hey, this is way too funny and needs to be serious, mm-hmm. it's really too late and you almost have to start from square one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think, you know, be honest about the approval process up front, bringing in people, you know, who's involved, those kinds of things. Let's skip to something from Patrick here. Um, that would be Patrick Dunnigan. Loyal listener, uh, preferred freelancer. Let's go with square peg round hole. And I only say that because he, he asked her it and <laughs> yeah. said, you may not want to talk about this. No, I think that's a, I think this is an important one. It is. So his, his point of square peg round hole is don't hire a videographer to do a short film. Don't hire a short film company to record a meeting for an archive. Don't hire a drone pilot to do your wedding video. Recognize what you're getting and, and what you can get and work with. Yeah, okay. Sorry. I totally blew that sentence. Basically, hire the right person for the job, mm-hmm. right? I mean, don't. And I think we often, we so often have just kind of abbreviated this to like, don't hire your nephew, right? Yeah. I, I mean, just because your nephew, and, and that's one extreme version of it, just because your nephew is, you know, in film school mm-hmm. or, you know, uh, uh, is more technically savvy than you are. I mean, we've literally got a 13-year-old moving our blog in WordPress from one site to a new, new site right now. Caleb's 13? That's, Caleb's not doing it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, so there's a time and place for but, for those types of yeah, projects. Right, but, but what's interesting is on video chat with her yesterday, walking her through the process, her parents, who are good friends of mine, were in the background, and it was too complicated for them. And yet, because she's 13 and she's grown up with the technology, I just had to give her WordPress logins, and she was like, I showed her how to do it once, and then she did one, and she didn't miss a step, Mm -hmm. right? It's like she's not freaked out by that. So, like, just because younger people are more tech-savvy and might, like, be on TikTok all the time, Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, as a less involved person in their life or not quite knowing what young people are doing these days, you think, oh, that's a video person, right? I mean, that's one extreme example of it is like, oh, I know they post social video so they can do my company's Mm -hmm. video, something like that. But another part too is just hiring professionals. Like when you need a professional. Well, or or just hiring the right kind of professional. Sure. Right? I mean, there are, um, there are people who do really good documentary style corporate work. Right. Um, when you get them to, you know, if you ask them to do something scripted, that's really not their wheelhouse. It doesn't mean they can't do it, but Mm -hmm. like they may not be the best person to do that. And so you may not get the results Mm -hmm. that you like. Talk to the agency about what kind of work they specialize in and try to find someone that specializes in the kind of work that you need, but also rely on their expertise. Mm -hmm. Because what you think you may need on the front end, that's kind of the asterisk on everything here is like, rely on their expertise also. Um, Anything else to say on square peg round hole? Again, right tool for the job, right person for the job, right agency for the type of video. Well, and that's why we've designed our agency this way, right? Is because every company that is doing video is gonna want, not every, I hate to say, you know, the superlatives or whatever, but like, most companies who are doing a lot of video, they're going to want some customer stories that are emotional. And then they're going to want a commercial. Mm-hmm. And those are, are going to be different things. Yes. And then they're going to want some uh, some interviews of their employees for hiring purposes. Mm-hmm. Like, they're all different things. And, like, we know that. We we have the experience in producing things. And we, we also have the experience of working with the right freelancers um, I think you could, I mean, you could also bring into this conversation using a generalist agency, right? Like mm-hmm. the full service agency, mm-hmm. just because you have an agency that does your SEO and your website and your social media and whatever, doesn't mean that they should be the ones doing your video for you either, 
right? I mean, I, th I think I think what you see is if they've those got a good video full, arm. Then sure, if, if they yeah, if yeah. they do, I think what you're seeing so much is the full service agencies are just like, what's the new branch of this, and then they try to sell yeah. that, and oftentimes I, I think they try to sell it before they really. You know, they're like, oh, well, we'll figure, we'll find someone locally or we'll, you know, mm -hmm. we've got someone in-house or whatever to figure this out. Let's just start selling video. Yeah. I think to some degree, everybody does that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I've, I've seen a lot of people lately who have gone and hang out their own shingle, you know, and, and go out on their own. And then they put, like, all this stuff from copywriting to video production to SEO to website mm -hmm. building. And I don't know. Like, I just, I think... Part of it is like that's the model agencies are starting to adopt. Yeah. Um, I, we f feel strongly about niching, and I think there's a lot of uh, purpose and a lot of like in, you could bring a lot more expertise to a situation if right. you have that niche. Th that's kind of where I go to my um, general contractor analogy is, you know, your full service agency can be the – like the general contractor on your mm -hmm. home construction mm -hmm. project, right? But your general contractor is going to hire framing guys. Mm -hmm. They're going to hire plumbers. drywall guys. Yeah. They're going to hire plumbers. They're going to hire the trades, right? Yeah. They're responsible for all of it working, the permitting, you know, all, all that, the schedules, the budgets, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, all of a sudden, you know, now uh, solar, right? Solar is something that a general contractor isn't necessarily going to just do. They're going to go out and find who's now, you know, the best solar installation mm -hmm. people. Uh, smart homes, um, you know, underground heat, mm -hmm. like all of these kind of new trades that are, that are coming about. It's, it's the, the smart general contractors for decades have just sought out those experts yep. and let them do what they that niche that they specialize in and they are still kind of responsible for, mm -hmm. you know, making sure the project gets done. I, th I think that's the better big agency model is to be the general contractor instead of keeping everything under yeah. Yeah. your roof. You're just responsible for who your plumber is, who your yeah. electrician is, who your solar guy is, whatever. All right. Uh, should we head back to one of the meds or do we want to do one of ours? Yeah, why don't we do any... Ours. Yours, ours. Um, I think this this one kind of this is to me one of the most important things, and this this is something that needs to be addressed even during the sales process before there's ever an agreement in place. Um, it's in the manifesto. It's in I think both of uh, Hamed and Patrick's, and probably some others. Is have have a goal. You need yes. to have an intention, a purpose for what we're doing. And that should be our North Star every time we try and make a decision. Our, does it achieve this or does it not achieve this? And that, that's just that's there to set the guardrails for every decision you have to make moving forward. And, and in, in addition to helping make creative decisions easier, it frees you up to make more interesting creative decisions. But it's also a great tiebreaker when there's conflict between the producer and the client mm -hmm. because you get to you get an hopefully objective. Yeah. all step back and take that objective look. It's like, okay, as the producer, we want to go this direction with this script, mm -hmm. this edit, this shot, whatever, with this line, this actor. And, uh, you know, the client wants to go a different way. You get to all step back. And, and again, this is, I think the thread through here is that collaborative trusting mm -hmm. relationship, mm -hmm. right? But if you can all trust each other to step back, you can say, this is our goal for this. Does this line, this actor, this script better serve that than this one? Mm -hmm. Or does or does this version better do that than this one? Yep. And, and then the initial goal makes those decisions for you. And, and, you know, another one of these on here is like, we're all people. But oftentimes you need to be, you know, reminded of that. Mm -hmm. Like... Vendors are people. Clients are people. Mm -hmm. um, and so oftentimes people get emotional about these things. Yeah. Right? And whether it's, you know, pride of their own idea or they're worried about their job or whatever it is, I mean, emotions come into it. And so to be able to say, look, from the beginning, we've said we wanted it to do this. 
it lets you kind of take some of the emotion and some of the personal yeah attachment attachment away from those kinds of decisions mm-hmm. and then it's not just trusting in each other but it's also just kind of trusting in the process and you know again that that purpose that intention it's like you know what if if we really did and that's why you can't just say at the beginning oh this is this is our goal for this like there has to be reasoning behind your purpose yeah Right, because if you don't have that, then it's easy to say, "Well, yeah, but actually things have changed, and that doesn't yeah. matter anymore." <laughs> and we've seen that happen. Yeah, and uh, you know, but but and if then everybody and I starts think getting really tired, yes, of the project really quickly. Yes, um, it's amazing how directly tied project fatigue is to purpose. <laughs> yes, it, or wandering. Yeah, wandering. I think more than anything. It, Ahmed's got it here too. Like whether so he's said push the C suite for the Y before you sign a contract. But yep. I think that could go either way, bottom up or top down. As long as if you're doing this video, it needs to be made clear to the CEO why you're doing this video. Yes. If, if it's coming bottom up, they need to know so that they have buy like they can buy into that too. Uh, or the CEO is is dictating something, and then the the why the 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 purpose behind all that is going to help that person, that marketing manager, whoever, execute on the right on the right set of goals. Yeah. So having that, like, that's one of the first things we establish during any project is it's, it's the first thing we have in any strategic concept is this video will blank. And, yes. And then everything supports that. Everything from the type of video it is to who we hire to where we shoot or if we animate or whatever else, it all, it all, plays into that yeah and and i think i think oftentimes we put i don't know if it gets through necessarily but i think we we inadvertently put so much on strategy that it feels like an obstacle but oftentimes we're just talking about like the purpose Mm -hmm. right like like what you intend this to do that simple answer is more of a strategy then a lot of people come into the Which video is, process. Which is, I need a customer. I need to interview my customer. Yeah. Okay, well, and, and I just heard recently, and I can't believe I haven't heard this before. I haven't sourced it, but apparently there's this theory of, like, the five whys. If you, if you mm-hmm. drill down five levels of why, you, you will ultimately get to that kernel of purpose. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, again, as an agency, as a producer, that's something that you can do to... To, it, it may not be that your client is is keeping it from you. It may just be that they don't know what the intent or the purpose is. And so they may start with, I need to interview my customers. Why? Because... They're in town. Yes. Why? Okay, so maybe... maybe that one. <laughs> Bad example, Justin. <laughs> um, okay, great. But why, you know, why do you want to interview your customer? Oh, because we need video. Okay, why do you need video? Well, because our marketing leads are drying up. Okay, right. Like why so, so the, why are those drying up? Well, we don't really People have any content. In our yeah, yeah, you know, we, we're losing a lot of customers. We can't retain competition. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Like, and it's probably not as direct as like why, 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 why? Like a three year old. Yeah. But you know, it's 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 being able to to just kind of keep you know, working around. And I mean, I, so many times we've talked about this a lot. I don't know about on the podcast, but like so much of the time we spend being therapists to our clients too. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's, but it's, it's not in a bad way, it's but just to them help to just, verbalize. It's giving, ex- exactly. It's giving them that sounding board and, and kind of asking those open-ended questions so that they can get to why they're really doing yeah. this. And we're, we're generally we're acting as a mirror too. We're just, asking enough questions to show them what they actually believe. And they, by, by the time they're, they have, actually have to verbalize it, it starts to form into something very clear and obvious for us as to what we need to do. Yeah, yeah. I was, You know we're always thinking of different agency names because, truth be told, we don't love ours. <laughs> um, it's growing on me. <laughs> uh, I, I can't remember what book. It was maybe a more beautiful question. Uh but Will you marry me? It was something about the the five the the five wives. I thought it would be funny to for the like an agency name to be three wise men with a W H Y S or three wise guys or just what the wise guys. 
<laughs> Get it? Like if you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you get it. I'll write it down on the sheet here. So like W-I-S-E? No. W-H-Y-S. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I have a couple more, but maybe we'll do another episode. of. I think we need a sponsor break first. Sure. Oh. All right. Um, it's now time for our sponsor, Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers. <clears throat> economic uncertainty violent crime the Chinese virus Democrats the world's never been a bigger shit show than it is right now and if you didn't spend the 20 teens prepping like a good prepper you might be afraid that it's too late to protect your family with a quality underground shelter well fear no more thanks to Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers are already constructed and hidden throughout Appalachia. Just pay Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers 3.721964 Bitcoin, and you'll get a map to one of Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunker locations where you can ride out the apocalypse or just the Biden presidency. Afraid you won't be the only family with a map to your bunker? You can trust me. I'm Uncle Rusty. Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers. That was going to be my concern is... Who, who's all going to show up there? Apparently you can trust him. But he, Uncle that, Rustin. That's not an answer. <laughs> that's what's here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Bud, he, he was a trusty guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, his uh, Uncle Rusty. What, what, what doesn't sound trustworthy about mm-hmm. Uncle Rusty? Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's an Eagle Scout, and we all know the, the Scout oath is... Scott is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. But it starts with... Cookies. <laughs> no, wait, sorry. Popcorn. Trust. Oh. Trust. Selling, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Big old things of popcorn, yeah. right? I sold wreaths, but I lived in the Northwoods, mm-hmm. and that's, you know... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I never made it out of Cub Scouts, so... Yeah, we can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in the Loch Ness Monster. Um, all right. Well, welcome to Uncle Rusty's yeah, Trusty Bunkers. Thank you bunkers. very much, Uncle Rusty. I would like to go to Hamed's fifth suggestion here, which is fifth on his list, but not fifth that we've used. Don't waffle on decisions. Be <laughs> what? Be confident rodent and pull the trigger. <laughs> if you need a few days to think about it, go for it. But don't get cold feet and reverse a decision out of fear. He's probably embarrassed knowing that there's a typo in here. Be confident, rodent. But uh, that's okay. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> not all clients are rats. No. That's not what he's saying. Uh, don't waffle on decisions. Be confident and pull the trigger. I, I, I think that's... I mean, I, I think that's a sneaky good point. I mean, it's, it, it's like third level... It's like a 300 level class of like client management, kind of. It's past to getting them to trust you. It's past to getting them to, which we haven't really dived, uh, dived into yet, but like compiling and curating feedback and those kinds of things. It's every ship needs a captain. Mm-hmm. And that captain, whether right or wrong, needs to be confident in their decision and, and go there. And you always have, as, as we've discussed, the purpose or the intent to back you up. Mm-hmm. But... You know, these can be hard decisions, but but sometimes, as the client, you just need to make the decisions. No matter how much you're trusting your agency, and maybe you're hands-off, but there are times when, as the client, you're just going to have to say, this doesn't work, mm-hmm. or this is the way to go. Right. And so that last one that you said, this is the way to go, that's that's important because that is that is their job as the client like as an agency we're supposed to bring our best recommendation and as experts bring the recommendation of here's what we should do it is the client's job to say no we need to do this instead or yes we will go that route not to say i don't know i'll know it when i see it that is perhaps the worst thing you can say to creatives because then what what do you expect out of us to to just keep trying things for the next four months until you get something that you like well and it's without any real direction it's it's, It's rant time. Um, I, that is on Patrick's list. That is on our list. Um, I know it when I see it is not a decision maker. No, and it's not. It's not even productive feedback. Right. 
Um, it's 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 worse than a wrong decision. Oh yeah, right. Uh, it's I, no I mean, that's exactly what you were saying. But 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 it it gives it gives nobody a direction to go, and it probably is a symptom of maybe a lack of a belief or just a lack of that original purpose, that original mm-hmm. intent. Yeah. Um, and and again, that can happen throughout a project. I mean. Uh, you know, a company's goals, a department's goals, an individual's career goals can change over the course of a project, mm-hmm. especially long term, multiple deliverable, you know, kind of like churning, not churning out content, but like regularly putting content mm-hmm. out there. Those are long term relationships and things can change. And you start to get feedback, right? You start to get feedback yep. from the videos like these ones are working, these ones aren't. Yep. But you need to use that information and, and set the new course yep. instead of saying, I don't know. Keep trying. And and I think there's a there's a strategic like decisions where you just say uh, I'll know it when I see it. But but like the ones that sting more are like the creative ones, like when you're casting an actor or a voiceover or like you have limited options, right? Mm-hmm. You 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 have the people who have responded to the casting call. Um. And if you don't feel like you're seeing the performance from like, like it's it's you almost have to go into those conversations like these are our options. These are our as the as the producer, as the agency's recommendations. Mm-hmm. We can always go back to the bigger list of yeah. 150 people who, who yeah. submitted something. But these are the eight people that we think best represent this role, this company, this video, whatever. And like those are your only options. And if you get through the, through those eight, and then God forbid, even go back through the original 150, and you're just like, "Yeah, nobody here's really doing it for me." Mm-hmm. This pri- like, if it were happening at casting, I would already be thinking of like, how do we grab a hold of this project because this mm-hmm. thing is now spiraling yeah. away. Because if if we can't make a confident casting decision, there's uh, about 800 more to make. Yeah, and 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 so much of it is. You know, timelines is on this list. So much of this is waterfall kind of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like it takes finalizing a script to do a read through. It takes casting an actor to do a read through. It takes finding a location to schedule a shoot. It takes, you know, all of these things have to happen before something else can even start. Right. Um, you you can't start editing without having shot the thing first. Right. Right. I mean, that's the most obvious. Right. So so it's it's not like you know, an initial timeline uh, is going to happen if we don't hit the dates along the way because every day delay we have in making this decision pushes everything behind here back a day. And then and then what happens when you're working with an agency who has other clients? Well, they probably, if as a client you can't adhere to the timeline, they probably then go work on their other client's work because and come back to you. When they can, because, <clears throat> and that might have been a little <laughs> petty sounding, but, but I mean, you know, the agencies are, are, the agencies hire project managers to manage multiple projects among, you know, f- basically fixed resources. And so as a project manager, if I know that I can have this person editing this thing for these two weeks, yep. and this person editing this thing for these two weeks, if the first one ends up going four weeks, that makes it really hard for me to put that editor on the next thing that they're supposed to do. And what I really should be doing as an agency is putting them on that second project and then coming back to the first project mm-hmm. because they couldn't get what we needed in mm-hmm. a timely manner. Um, and, and you know, there isn't necessarily indecision or malice involved in those non-decisions. Sometimes it's just that there's not like an immediate need for something. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's often better to work under a tight, strict deadline because there's an event yeah. or a product announced. There, there's something on a calendar, uh, you know, the fifteenth of next month. This thing has to be done three days before that so that mm-hmm. it can be in the rehearsals of the you know, yep. whatever it is. Um, even if that's like a super tight timeline and you're panicked about whether you can get it done, at least you know that it's going to happen in that period. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes there isn't that set like due date. And as we said before, a video's never finished, it's just taken away. And if it's if not you taken don't away, have the taken away part, never- then it's never getting done. Yeah. And 
you know, different agencies work different ways. I mean, there's a whole lot of agencies that will just charge you delay fees mm -hmm. or late fees to, to do that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, they will basically penalize you as a client if you aren't, you know, getting them the feedback and the agreed to 48 hours, 72 mm -hmm. hours, whatever it is. And so that can become more expensive. And then nobody feels good about that. Right. And so, you know, I'd probably go back to the trust at, at this point and like as a client be communicative with your agency if it's like you know i don't know y you you can cede certain decisions if you don't feel strongly about them yeah right you could say i don't know so since you guys are the experts you pick what about when there's like let's just for sake of a better term call it an active god that that puts things on hold. It's not really anybody's fault, but the agency is by nature of that having to spend more time on a given project for the same amount of money, yeah. and or the client is being charged for something that wasn't their fault either. Right. What's the right thing to do? Go to a completely socialist system where money isn't involved and <laughs> um, tear down the system. Yeah, anarchy, obviously. <clears throat> I think that's where you just have to talk. You have to talk yeah. together and figure well, out what's fi like. Again, you said these are humans, and that's the, and that's the thing. I mean, we've had. I can't tell you how many times I have been absolutely terrified to have like a one on one or even like a group phone call with a client because like it's just not working, mm -hmm. right? So a decision isn't getting made, feedback isn't being shared. It could be on either side, and and you have the conversation and like a half an hour year later, you're like, Oh, that was not nearly as bad as I thought yeah. it was going to be. Yeah. Right. And, and so it's just so often, it's so much easier to just have the, the quick conversation. Come to the table with what you do have of like, here's yeah. what I, here's what I'm feeling. Yeah. Here's what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing. And I, yeah, I get, I get that you don't, you don't see it, but I need more than that. And so, so based on this, we really think we should go here. Mm -hmm. Does that work? And, and, and try to give them that because they may be just as trapped um, as you feel. Yeah. And, and they just need some guidance too. So uh, again, going back to the captain metaphor, I mean, a captain doesn't like do all the research and, <coughs> you know. He relies on his crew. He relies on his crew to say, these are the conditions. This is our chart. This is what's ahead. This is, you know, how much fuel we have, whatever. I'm like, okay, well then let's plot this course. Mm -hmm. That's what a captain does. And so sometimes you just have to say, you just have to pull off the Band-Aid and be like, like as annoyed as you can be with a client, you don't really know what's in their head. And it's just so easy. God, especially through emails. It's yeah. so easy. Yeah. Be a good client by like requiring phone call conversations instead of like emails. Mm -hmm. But like emails are so easily misinterpreted. And put off. It's easy to put and, off a and, decision if it's been asked and, through email. And I'm guilty of it because I I love the ability to to have the time to craft an email to organize my thought my thoughts in a response. And so I, I fall into it all the time when there are when there are issues and, and I hate confrontation too, right? So like if it's on me, I'm going to come up with this like very logical bullet point response. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the act of going through that helps me probably more. Like, at that point, I shouldn't hit send. I should now pick up the phone, <laughs> call the client, and just say, here are my concerns. And then, well, and then he'll re you'll realize you misinterpreted it, and you're like, oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, you just wanted this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, no. I didn't mean so and so. Like, I didn't mean rodent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I meant... Not potato rolls. <laughs> Uh, oh, well, that changes everything. <laughs> and, you, I mean, I, I have lost sleep. I have, I mean, just with, with, you know, client X yesterday, right? Like, it was clear that we just needed to have a, a conversation. We talked for, like, 35 minutes. and Clarity. It was clarity. Yeah. Like, like, it was, like, instead of, like, you know, we feel like we're going two directions, it was like, oh, great, we're going to do this compromise thing, and we all want this thing to be great. Yeah. Fantastic. Yep. And then I could watch hockey. Um, <laughs> all right, where do we go next? Let's hit maybe one or two more, and then I have a question to ask. That all right? Um, I think Patrick's number four here is. What I like I'm that a thinking. lot. Questions before criticism. Questions phrased properly 
can lead to better understanding in conversations than criticism. Say, I felt like the mood dictated cool versus they thought warm for the color set dressing, etc. So this to me kind of ties to problems before solutions. So one of my big things with client feedback is I'd rather hear from a client, I don't like how this shot works. Mm -hmm. Instead, or I don't like this shot in this montage. Yep. Right. As opposed to Take replace the shot. the shot at 34 seconds with something else. Mm -hmm. or, or even like a very specific, like, like why? And so I think the, the questions before criticism, questions before feedback, problems before solutions, again, rely on our expertise. Trust that, that you can share the issue you have with something without having to come with a solution. And let us find a solution. When, it, when a creative, like a when a creative comes to us with with a first cut, right? Like uh, maybe it's an editor we hired for a project. We always ask first, like, what feedback do you want? Yes. What kind of feedback do you want? And that's a really great question. It disarms the entire situation and allows communication to take place first. And then, if there is a, a moment to to criticize, hold off. Because something saying something like, tell me about why you did this. Mm -hmm. Ask asking the creative team or the, the editor or the shooter or whatever, tell me why you shot that or tell me why you edited it this way. Can help you understand so much more about the decisions they made instead of just saying don't because they could be on a really cool track yes. that you could derail. Yeah. And and <laughs> and this is another one where I think it, it uh, internal feedback, client feedback, have the verbal like have the audio conversation, right? Like have an actual conversation instead of written mm -hmm. because I can totally see writing in frame IO to an editor. What were you thinking here? <laughs> <laughs> meaning <laughs> as I look at Anthony meaning like, Oh, this is cool. What, what was your thought process mm -hmm. here? They're like, I want to pull this thread. Yeah, exactly. And it's read as what the fuck were you thinking here? <laughs> Right, and so, and it's again. That's just kind of the problem with the and and if you're just kind of talking about the thing, even if you like, I'm gonna put all my notes in Frame.io, and then let's have a conversation about sure. each of them. They can see the what were you thinking and like prepare for that, and then you get to it, it's like, dude, this is awesome. What were you thinking? And you're like, mm -hmm. oh, that what was I thinking? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, no, I just I don't know. It just reminded me of a commercial I saw, and I thought this was a thing and whatever. And then like, yes. Instead of derailing that idea, you end up with something that, that's potentially better. Yeah. Um, stop using email, I think, is what this episode should be called. Um, yeah, I feel, like, I feel like I've written a blog post about this before. I don't remember. But I feel like I've written that, that the two sides of this are, like, if, if you're a producer or an agency, be proactive when you're sharing anything that needs revisions, anything that needs client approval with here's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Right. So if it's like, if it's, if you're trying to get like dialogue lock on a mm -hmm. script, but you're not sure about the visuals yet. And color. Right. And, and so yeah. you've got some options in here because you're working through it or whatever, send the script and say, look, what I'm looking for here is the dialogue. You can ignore the visuals column yeah. or, or forget the direction or whatever. We'll figure that out later. Does, this messaging work, mm -hmm. right? That's what I want to, you know, for this first cut, it's like, you know, we got into this and you said, if I thought of anything, try some things. So I've got a cut that was what you asked for, but I want to show you this first. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this, this, and this? Mm -hmm. The flip side of that is being a good client is, is if your producer doesn't prompt you for those mm -hmm. before giving the feedback to say, Hey, this is, you know, great. Excited to look at this. What kind of feedback yeah. do you want? So there, there's, again, that's one where there's, you know, to be a better vendor, prompt them yep. for certain feedback, but to be a better client, if you don't get that before mm -hmm. giving, and I, we've talked about it before, some, sometimes there are those clients who just need to share something. Yes. Right? And, and, they, and they don't feel like they can approve anything without asking for, you know, a certain a change, font or something, a different yeah. font, a different font weight, whatever, you know. Use use this color in the in the branding guide instead of this color, um, and and that's you know I don't know be a better client by realizing that and not doing that if you don't have to, but you I'll, know I'll put up with that any day of the week. Be a better agency <laughs> and and you know get that about your clients mm -hmm. and you know kind of expect it too. It's you know and I think in the being a bit better vendor maybe on both sides of this is like don't take anything personally. 
we are all humans, but like, you know, it's business. For the we're, most part, we're all trying to do our best. Yeah. We don't want to suck at our jobs. Yeah. So uh, just to kind of go down this trail a little bit further, first is what kind of feedback do you want if they haven't been proactive in directing that? Then asking, all right, why did you make this decision? And then if you still don't agree, Patrick wrote it here very nicely, you say, I, I see what you're doing, but I feel like we need to go this direction, and this is why. Yeah. Those are those are really important elements to, to share so that that person can then see the bigger picture or, or see a new direction that they weren't aware of. And like, oh, okay. And then they can, because they know why, they can make better decisions down the road as well. Well, and, and, and I'll go back to, again, I don't like naming clients here, but, you know, if he's listening, he'll probably put two and two together. But everyone else won't know. In the client conversation yesterday, you know, one of the things uh, that, that I wanted to push back on was kind of the level of humor. Felt like we were getting too, like, subtle and witty and, like, humorist. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, like, this is supposed to be a viral video, for yeah. lack of a better, right? This is supposed to capture attention and be a shareable thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I left it as kind of the last thing that I wanted to discuss. And so, of course, I was like, you know, okay, I'm going to push back. And, and I pushed back and I said, look, I really think that we, should, we shouldn't pull our punches. And his response was literally, well, if you feel that strongly about it, let's do it. That's why I hired you guys. I mean, not an entire surprise for that client because he's very even keeled, but mm -hmm. like, like just to hear that even, right, is, is sometimes it's as much as you might expect and want to hear that from a client to actually hear it. It's like, that went a long way. Sure. I know that you're going to go on set and direct that thing in a much clearer, yes. clearer yes. direction instead it, of having to waffle on, should I, should I not? Yeah. And not being fully committed. And so we're going to end up doing both. Right. But that's fine. And then yep. we get to see which one works. Yep. And I'm totally fine. And, th and that's another thing here, too, is there's often compromise. There isn't necessarily absolute truth on any of these decisions, right? That's why we put things out there. Mm -hmm. We look at the analytics. And, you know, if people drop off at a certain point, well, maybe, you know, adding that third scene was a mistake. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's why you then do the analytics to then kind of inform what you change mm -hmm. next time. You had a question. So we did a lot of, uh, there's more stuff here and we could, but I think in general we got like, it's like communication with humans is, yeah. is a big part of this tr tr process. Trusting communication with we're all people. Yeah. Yeah. And expectations. I, there's a lot of expectation management. I could either ask this question now or, or we could turn this into a podcast, but what do you think a like, all the clients out there, what do you think their response is to uh, a podcast like this? Do you think that they How have much it, can have I advice? pay you and how quickly? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I, I mean I would love to I, I would love to take that prompt and put it out there to the audience of those, those people in the clients. Yeah. Just like again, all the feed all the requests for this episode came from producers, mm -hmm. various levels of producers and, you know, on, on the vendor side. Yeah. And I would love, and we may have to be proactive about this, but I would love for those on the client side to share what makes a vendor a good vendor and what things they've found work best for them as a client mm -hmm. also. Um, and I think that, that, I mean, if we can get some feedback from you all on, on that, I think that's a fantastic episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Yeah, as we have two audiences, really. Yeah. Shall we quickly hear from our sponsor again? Let's do it. All right. Just baby up. Economic uncertainty, violent crime, the Chinese virus, Democrats. The world's never been a bigger shit show than it is right now. And if you didn't spend the 20 teens prepping like a good prepper, you might be afraid that it's too late to protect your family with a quality underground shelter. Well, fear no more, thanks to Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers. Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers are already constructed and hidden throughout Appalachia. Just pay Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers 3.721964, oh, it's changed since the first read, 3.73164 Bitcoin, and you'll get a map to one of Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunker locations where you can ride out the apocalypse, or just the Biden presidency. Afraid you won't be the only family with a map to your bunker? You can trust me. I'm Uncle Rusty. Uncle Rusty's Trusty Bunkers. All right. Well, Thank thanks you, to Uncle, Uncle Rusty. Rusty. Yeah. 
from the team over Happy there. Happy to have you aboard. Uh, good luck with that. I know the world is in uncertain times right now, mm-hmm. but uh, we can all we can all rest assured that we can get a bunker. Yeah. All right. Rest um, assured. Rest assured. Um, I believe that's our episode. That'll do. Thanks so much for listening. Thank uh, you. As usual, subscribe, like, whatever, yeah, podcast, and all those wonderful iTunes, clients out there. Stitcher, all you clients uh, or Let's people in the client position, people who have been in the client position. Um, yeah, congratulations for making it to the end of the episode. <clears throat> and we'll. Uh, Which one's the dark side? Because people say, like, I went to the dark side to the agency or I went to client side. Mm. Which one's the dark side? Um, definitely the client side. <laughs> have it uh yeah um okay well Thank you. uh let's go Pull back to our conspiracy theories okay yeah great how do you feel about <clears throat> the chupacabra see some of this so some of these are just like i don't think there's a theory of chupacabra right like uh-huh. if, like th- there's theories about jfk's assassination sure but the theory of Chupacabra, like, okay, there's some, maybe some physical evidence or questionable murders and that kind of thing. But I don't know that the, the theory exists. What would you call the theory? Well, that they I exist or they say, don't? Yeah, that's just, I mean, so, the theory is that there is this, like, demon unidentified demon creature that, like, eats goats and meat or whatever. But they have found com- really compelling evidence for, like, hybridization of coyotes and things and stuff like that. Where you see, especially once you like add in me, and all of a sudden, you're